All right, here we are again. Did this last night. Doing it again tonight. We'll do it tomorrow night, too. We'll have a live show tomorrow night. We know that. That one's already planned. That one's the the regularly scheduled live Panther Lair show. We'll do it tomorrow night at uh, 8 o'clock. I think so. Eight Might have to push that one back to 8.30. We'll see. Um, it depends on a couple things, but we'll be live tomorrow night. Jim Hammett will join us for the live Panther show. Like we do everyone, every Wednesday night here at youtube.com slash Panther But the hits just keep on coming. So the live shows are just going to keep on coming. We did one last night after the news of day on Hayes going into the transfer portal broke. And we tended to talk about Pitt losing a football player to the transfer portal and adding a basketball player from the transfer portal. We ended up just talking about the football side of things last night. Here we are again today. Pitt loses another defensive starter on the football team to the transfer portal, and they add another basketball player from the transfer portal. And my guess is that we're probably going to talk mostly about football here again today. I'd like to get into a little bit of basketball talk. We'll see if it ends up making its way into a morning pit for tomorrow, or this just might be your morning pit. We'll just release this. Who, who knows? Last night we ended up doing the live show, and we did a morning pit. We'll see if we double up on the content or maybe just let this one ride in. But the latest news today, Solomon DeShields going into the transfer portal. DeShields leaves Pitt with one year of eligibility remaining. He lives, leaves Pitt as a returning starter at linebacker, a guy with a clearly defined role, a guy who's going to be a starter, a defensive leader, and one of the best overall players on this team for 2024. And he leaves. After participating in just a little bit of spring camp, Missed most of camp or, or a decent, decent chunk of camp, including the spring game. Um, and now he's gone. And, and he was really one of the linchpins of this defense. I mean, one of the key guys that I think they were sort of building around and counting on to make a lot of plays and be a, a, a significant contributor on defense at the money linebacker position where he really found a home last year. And, you know, he had bounced around throughout his career, played wide receiver. Um, I think he came to college initially as I don't want to say as a linebacker I think they initially recruited him as a linebacker and then he moved to wide receiver because he played both in high school um, and then he moved back to linebacker and, and and a big part of it for Solomon DeShields after his first like three years 2020 20 and one I think heading into 22 he really kind of said you know I want to be a linebacker I, I want to stick at linebacker and really committed himself to it and by last season he was he was a good player he was a you know, a solid contributor, a key player on the um, defensive side of the ball. I, I, I meant to have Pitt's stats from last season brought up just to go over what DeShields did for Pitt in 2023. Um, played in 12 games, although, to be fair, those 12 games included the Wake Forest game when he played on the opening kickoff and got hurt and didn't play all that. So he played basically 11 games on defense. I don't know if he made a tackle in that Wake Forest game, but he was Pitt's third leading tackler with 58 tackles. Um, he was, I believe, second on the team with eight tackles for loss, second to day on Hayes, incidentally. He had two sacks, which is, uh, I mean, ranked fourth on the team tied for fourth uh he also had a pass breakup he had four quarterback hurries according to Pitt's official stats we can look at what he recorded on uh, pro football focus I think they tend to record a few more things in terms of pressures but you know I think he was really looked at you know for a defense we talked up the linebackers so much heading into last season I talked up the linebackers so much heading into last season I talked up Bengali Kamara in particular heading into last season and what ended up happening is that DeShields was the more consistent, reliable player and the better player. And when Kamara went into the transfer portal in December, he thought, well, okay, well, at least they still have DeShields back. And DeShields, like so many of these guys, made uh, an announcement of his return and how excited he was to come to run it back one more time and all of those kinds of things, just like Dayon Hayes did. And you know, just like a bunch of other guys, um, Hayes has subsequently left for the transfer portal and the shields has joined him and i and i think joined him is probably the the appropriate way to phrase it hayes and DeShields were in the same recruiting class that 2020 recruiting class uh it, which also included bengali kamara and i think those three were all pretty close i think the shields and hayes in particular were pretty close and from some people i've talked to you know once hayes went into the transfer portal it wasn't a huge surprise that DeShields followed him 
And like I said, maybe we shouldn't have been all that surprised that Hayes went in. And I think if we if we knew about the connection between Hayes and DeShields, maybe we wouldn't have been surprised about this. But it does have a feeling of when it rains, it pours. And we can sit here and we will talk about the linebacker depth and what the two deep looks like and what the roster looks like and how they, you know, what they might be at, at linebacker. If they're going to be good or they're not going to be good, or they're going to be okay. But it's never good to lose a returning starter. It's never lo- good to lose a veteran player who, who was figuring to be one of your best players on defense and maybe on the team. It's never a good look. You know, it, it, and it's not just a, not a good look. It's not good. It's not good for your football team. But here we are. And, and somehow, I mean... I was going to say, like, this wasn't even the most ridiculous transfer portal news we saw today. And there were some other things I'm going to bring up in a little bit as we kind of, because inevitably this conversation is going to turn to not just um, talking about Solomon to Shields and Dayon Hayes, but it's going to talk about the transfer portal and NIL and all of those things. Uh, but this was a case where a guy is walking away from a clearly defined role in a defensive scheme that he knows well, that he spent the last four years learning, that he, he that fits him well, that's been developed around him. You know, he's grown into the position. He spent four years learning the position, and he's walking away from it. He's probably not going to find a better fit defensively. He's certainly not going to find a defense that he knows better. And that's, you know, to quote the great G.I. Joe, that's half the battle is just knowing it Um, and he's walking away and he won't even have a spring camp and spring, you know, semester to learn a new defense. And, and I mean like some of this stuff, it's like, well, it's not rocket science, but some of it, there is some, you know, some parts of it are pretty involved. And you look at guys who it takes until their third or fourth year to really master a system. And he's going to walk away from this system that he spent the last four years learning. And ultimately I think getting a pretty good grasp of, and he's going to go somewhere new and try and learn it over the summer to ha- to try to put himself in position for a featured role and a starting role to showcase himself for the NFL. Is that is that what we're talking about here? Is that what we're being sold? That Solomon DeShields, like Deion Hayes, like DeAndre Jules, uh, are, that these guys are looking for a better showcase for their abilities as they try to make their way to the NFL next year? I mean, these are guys, I mean, Hayes, uh, DeShields and Jules in particular, three guys who walked away from starting positions on a defense, you know, playing for a defensive head coach, one of what feels like one of the few c- schools in the country, one of the few teams in the country that still feature the defense and prioritize the defense and make the defense sort of their calling card, where there have been far more draft picks on that side of the ball than on offense over the last nine years. And they're walking away from featured roles in an attacking, aggressive defense to play for a different kind of defensive scheme that they're going to have to learn in the case of Hayes and Shields over the next four months. Good luck with that. And I'm not to say that I don't think they can succeed. It's not to say that I don't think they'll do well. I think they're talented players. I think they should have a good chance. But if we're talking about preparing you for the NFL, if we're talking about showcasing you for the NFL, buddy, you're probably not going to get a better opportunity than this. And I know, and, and, and it kind of happened as we were talking last night, Dayon Hayes, some kind of interaction over Twitter DMs with Chris Carter from the Post-Gazette saying that, you know, I just don't think we're going to win. And, like, I get that. You know, and, and we can have a separate conversation about whether Dayon Hayes' stated concerns are valid or not. But whether you're winning or not, you can still be featured on the defense. So you may not think the offense is going to help you win, but you can still be featured on this defense. You can still make an impact on this defense. You can still be really good on this defense and play yourself into a draft, uh, you know, into a, a, a draft pick. You know, Darrell Revis was what a number fifteen overall pick or something. He was a first round draft pick, and his two last two years of college, they went five and six and six and six. You know, you you know. Jeff Oda was a first round draft pick and his two years at Pitt, they went six and six and five and seven. You know, LaShawn McCoy was, what, what did he go? The second round and his two years at Pitt, they went five and seven. And uh, I guess they went nine and four the next year. James Connor was a, a second or third round pick. Tyler Boyd was the second round. They weren't great. You know, none of those Pitt teams were great. 2013, 14, 15, and 16. In the case of Boyd, 13, 14, and 15, they went 
seven and six, six and seven, and eight and five. I mean, is that overwhelming success? Is that the kind of well, it didn't seem to hurt his draft prospects or his NFL profile. You know, Connor's teams in 13, 14, 15, and 16, I mean, what, they topped out at eight and five for two years after going seven and six and six and seven. So I, I'm not sure I really buy that all that much. The goal right now, and I mean I'm not I'm telling I'm not telling other people how to live their lives, but I would think the goal right now, if you're facing your last year of eligibility of college, if you're about to run out of eligibility. Okay, let, let's start right there. If you were a legitimate pro prospect, if you were ready for the NFL right now and you could just focus on NIL and you know, go get that bag because you're going to be in the pros, like if you were already at that level, you would have left for the NFL already. So you're already in this group of guys who are staring down their final year of eligibility. Okay, so your pro prospects are already at that point where you're coming up on your final year of eligibility. Okay, and your goal, I would think, your goal in your final year of eligibility is preparing yourself for the NFL, best showcasing yourself for the NFL and helping build your draft stock, right? I, I would think that would be the priority right now. But, you know, if that's the case, are you doing that in the best way by – transferring somewhere and spending the next four months learning the defense are you giving yourself the best chance to showcase your abilities as a pro prospect i'm not saying it can't happen i'm not saying it won't happen you know i think solomon DeShields shields and Dayon hayes are really good players i think deandre jules is a good player you know certainly they're very good college players of varying levels i think DeShields shields is better than hayes he's made more of an impact over the course of his career and probably and i would say that about you know DeShields shields versus jules as well but i think you know those guys will have a chance but you'd have a hard time convincing me that they're going to get a better opportunity to showcase themselves somewhere else where they're learning a new defense that may or may not feature them the way this one will. The way this defense they've been studying and learning and, and, and entrenching themselves in over the past four years. You know, what that one will do for you. Playing in a defense you know, something you're comfortable in, something where you are a featured player, which... The defensive end, the line, outside linebackers. I mean, you guys, they're going to have opportunities to make plays. Lots of opportunities to make plays. And it doesn't matter if the quarterback uh, of your team is good or not. You're going to have opportunities to make plays. And, and put out some great tape when you play in this defense. I, I mean, I think we know that. And I'm, I'm not advertising for Pitt's defense right now. I mean, we, like we know that. You look at where the draft picks have come from over the last 10 years. It's been on that side of the ball. You know, Kalijah Kansi played himself into a first round draft pick on a nine win team. Yeah, you know, sure, in 2022 they went 9 and 4, but you know, it's not like the quarterback play was very good. That didn't hold him back. His play stood out and he had an exceptional year because he played in a defense that he knew and he played in a defense that featured him. Walking away from that for your final year final year of eligibility for a little more NIL money. I mean, I'm not, again, I, I, I don't presume to judge anyone's situations. I don't want to judge anyone's decision-making, but I just, I, I, I guess I question it a little bit. I question whether or not that's the best move long-term. But that's the decision that those guys made. We got a lot of comments and questions already coming in on the uh, the chat. We got super chatters, which I love to see. Uh, appreciate you guys for the support for sure. Um, you guys, uh, you know, big time uh, contributors and supporters. Uh, if you want to make sure your comment gets read or your question gets answered, you should, um, uh, uh, you should be a super chatter. Sorry. I was already starting to scan, scan through here that, um, you know, scan through some of these comments and questions. I'm, I'm looking forward to answering a lot of these things. If you want to ask a question or, uh, post a comment, post those things there, and we will try to read, uh, as many as we can. And, um, as always, uh, like I say, if you want to be a super chatter, you click that little dollar sign down at the bottom of the chat and you can, uh, support the podcast with a couple bucks and we'll be sure to read your comment or your question. Uh, let's see. Dan K is a super chatter. He's the first one I see here. He says, what happened with that Ivy league team that tried to unionize is unionizing players, a logical system for college sports. Maybe this could have con maybe this could have contracts to prevent rampant transferring i'm not sure what the latest is on the uh, attempts to unionize look i mean i think ultimately 
you're going to get down to a system where there is one sort of governing body of college, at least college football, you know, and, and, and maybe basketball we'll see. There's a part of me that thinks that ultimately we'll see a separation with football from the rest of the other sports, which to some extent would make sense because it really is its own entity. But I think you'll see some sort of governing body organizing college football. And and part of that, I mean, there'll be a lot of parts of it. And most of those parts will make a lot of money, like an expanded playoff and divisions and, you know, conferences that make a lot of sense. And there was something that was floated today that was basically like a Pitt fan's wet dream because it was a conference. It was a Northeastern conference that included, yeah, Boston College and Syracuse and Rutgers. But along with Pitt, there was Penn State, there was West Virginia, and there was Notre Dame and Virginia Tech, which is great. I mean, it would be beautiful to have that conference, but I digress. Um, I, I think ultimately, in some point in the, in the near future, there will be a governing body kind of put together by the SEC and Big Ten that will divvy up, um, you know, reorganize the sport. Uh, and and part of that, in addition to making lots more money, part of that will be sharing the revenue with the players. Now, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to get into collective bargaining and to get into collective bar and, and contracts. And to get into collective bargaining and contracts, you're going to need some sort of player representation. And uh, I joked to somebody the other day that after a, a, a bad offseason, maybe Scott Boris will drop baseball and become a college football, uh, I don't even know what it would be, agent, czar, player rep, you know, maybe maybe he'll lead up the player uh, unionization movement in baseball in uh, college football. Um, but I mean, but that's to me sort of you know if if you play out what the next ten years might look like, I, I you know or five years maybe, I, I think that's a realistic option. I, I said last night, like I you know we have, I have no idea what the next five years is going to hold for Pitt. I have no idea what the next five years is going to hold for college football. I have no idea what the next five years is going to hold for the ACC or anything like that. Uh, but I think that's one possibility, and, and it's something that sort of makes sense. Ultimately, the decisions are going to be made by the conference commissioners, and, and it'll be, you know, uh, most of the power will be in the hands of the commissioners and leadership of the two biggest conferences, the Big Ten and the SEC. Now, there's part of me that thinks that those conferences, while they're out to make the most money for themselves, will see value in adding most, if not all, of the remaining Power Five schools and sort of reorganizing into something you know and it'll make a lot of money because if you have those schools under one umbrella i think you can really you know i, I know people will look at it and say like well why would ohio state and alabama and texas want to share with Pitt, if you know boston college or washington state i think you know if you are those conferences i, I think you can look at it as a very uh, appealing attractive and um money-making venture to reorganize college sports in your own vision, you know, and, and, and create your own model of, and I, I say college sports, it's college football is what we're talking about. I think you can reorganize college football in your own sort of designed model that maximizes profit, everything from scheduling, you know, obviously TV is a giant part of it's It's all of it because that's where the giant revenues come from, but you reorganize it. You can create the schedules and the matchups and everything you want to have. And then a, a big playoff a 12 team playoff a 16 team playoff you can you can expand it to whatever you want it to be and you can make it cost as much as you want it to cost and you can maximize everything for profit and i think you know you can do that by including everyone and then you can say look we've we've redrawn the map of what college football is but if you do that and 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 even if you don't i, I think you are going to have a point where player representation um, because it is going to be part of it because the, because revenue sharing is going to be part of it, you know, sharing that money, splitting that money with the student athletes and the call, the football players is going to be part of it. And there's a lot of tentacles that span out from that and title nine and the other sports and Olympic sports and how it all sort of comes together and how it all shakes out. And I, I'm not smart enough to answer any of those questions. I'm not smart enough to answer any of these questions, to be honest with you guys. Um, I'm definitely not smart enough to answer that stuff, but I could see it working out that way. Uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a surprise. Eric Bruno is this, Eric Bruno is a super chatter. He wants to talk basketball, and I appreciate that that uh, Pit Chat Pit Chag has been trying to uh, curve the conversation to basketball too. But Eric Bruno says, with the additions of Cam Corrin and Damian Dunn, what additional pieces do you see Jeff Capel and uh, company pulling in? Seeing some rumblings on Adu Thero 
as well, or as an addition. Yeah, that's sort of lingering out there, and we'll see. Um, we'll see if it comes to pass. Uh, I just kind of keeping an eye on that now. Thero, the the kid from Kentucky, who um, you know could be a possibility. But with Damian Dunn, uh, today's addition, the guard from Houston, formerly of Temple, uh, he committed today after visiting over the weekend. He adds a guard to that rotation. So now they really have four viable guards with Jalen Lowe, Ishmael Leggett, Dunn, and Brandon Cummings, who's coming in as a true freshman. And I think Dunn's really intriguing because Dunn could play the one or the two. He could play next to Jalen Lowe, um, but he could also be a ball handler on the court with Lowe or in place of Lowe. And he could line up in a three-guard lineup. And I think it could be a pretty dangerous three-guard lineup with Lowe, Leggett, and Dunn playing together. I think you end up with uh, some of the lineup flexibility that they had this past season, just with the 11 guys they have right now after adding Corrin and Dunn. I think you end up with some of the lineup flexibility they had last season where they, they can roll out there, <coughs> excuse me, with low Leggett and Zach Austin. And then they can sort of transition into the three guard lineup with low Leggett and Dunn. Um, I think they'll have, you saw they had some flexibility to rotate the guards a little bit to stick with two guards this past season when they had Bub Carrington and Jalen Lowe and Ishmael Leggett, uh, but then they had just sort of defaulted into three guards for most of the time as the season wound down. I think this year you have a viable fourth guard option in Brandon Cummings. I think he's much better as a viable fourth guard as a true freshman than he would have been as a third as a third guard. You know, if they didn't add someone like Dunn. But, I mean, last year they really only had the three guards. They were hoping to have four with Dior Johnson, but obviously that didn't work out. Now, I, I, I mean, you can make a pretty strong case they're in a, be, a, a better place, in a stronger place with the backcourt than they were entering last season, if, even if they had Dior Johnson. Because going into last season with Dior Johnson on the roster, they basically had three guards with no experience plus a transfer from Rhode Island. This year they've got a returning starter at point guard, uh, the sixth man of the year as the two guard who will fight and I think probably push himself into the starting lineup. They add a guy who's transferring in from Houston, but really before that he was really good at Temple uh, to be the third guard or play as a two guard or battle with Leggett for that two guard spot, maybe even push his way into the starting lineup and start three guards. And then you've got this really talented freshman. So instead of having three inexperienced guys in one low major transfer, you've got two really experienced guys, a mid-major transfer who's really coming from a high major school most directly and and one inexperienced player. I think it's a, it's a now obviously we're colored a little bit or, or affected a little bit by what Bub Carrington became and what Jalen Lowe became and what Ishmael Leggett became. But I think if you look at where the backcourt is heading into this season, assuming all four of these guys are still here. Because look, Tomorrow's roster isn't promised to anyone. But if, I think if you compare what it looks like they'll be heading into this season to what it looked like last year heading into the season, I think they're in a better place. Now, whether we say that at the end of the year, if we say that this group ended up being better than, you know, Carrington, Lowe, and Leggett, I mean, that remains to be seen. And that that's a tall order because those three guys were really good. I think it's a pretty good possibility that Lowe and Leggett take steps forward this season. I think Dunn will be a nice addition. He was a 34, 35% shooter from three. Um, in the past, I think Lowe and Leggett can shoot a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously Guillermo Diaz Graham is a shooting threat. And then you're gonna get more you should get more post scoring, interior scoring out of Cam Corn, which I think can change uh the, the dynamic a little bit for what it looks like for those guys shooting on the perimeter. If Corn can be a threat inside, which we think he can, then or if he can be the threat inside that I think a lot of us believe he can be, then even if you're, even if you don't have that Blake Hinson or Greg Elliott type as a shooter outside, you still should have, uh, you know, you should be able to almost, I don't want to say get more out of the guys that you do have out there, but they should have better opportunities. If that makes any sense, because you have more of a threat inside. You can't, you can't run guys off the three point line quite as much. You know, you have to pay a little bit of respect to the offensive game inside because it's going to be more of a threat than it was with Federico Federico and 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 more of a threat than it was with Guillermo Diaz Graham playing inside. So what was even your question, Eric? <laughs> I, I I lost track of your question. Oh, do you do I see them? Who else do I see them pulling in? I mean, I, I think they're gonna keep working. They've got two open spots. Like I say, they're gonna work on Thero. Um 
and then we'll, we'll see. I think they could use another power forward, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're content to go into it with the two Diaz Graham twins playing at that spot. Really? Um, but maybe this will finally be the year they have all 13 scholarship guys accounted for from the beginning of the year. We'll see. Uh, Fred Thompson is a super chatter. Fred doesn't have a comment here. Let me see if you said something, Fred. Where's your uh, comment? I think you said something somewhere. I don't see it, but Fred, I appreciate you being a super chatter and uh, supporting the podcast. If you have anything you want to say, throw your comment up. We'll try and keep an eye out for it. Bill Florigen is a super chatter. He says, uh, it seems a lot of these players get bad advice on making these decisions. I know, I don't know, uh, but it seems short-sighted and based more on emotion than logic. There's a there's a lot of interesting dynamics here, and I I can't speak to every guy's decision-making process and, and what influences it and what drives them to make the decisions they make. I, I do think there are different dynamics, though. I, I do think there are, like, real agents involved in some of this stuff. Like, real, honest-to-God agents involved. And they're probably, you know, some of their advice might be good and some of it might be bad. I think there are also players who are getting their, you know, advice um, and guidance from just some guy who's a friend. You know, it might not even be like a lawyer or anything like that. Just some guy. And, uh, you know, just some, you know, family friend or an uncle or something like that. And again, maybe that's good advice. Maybe it's not. But I think there are a lot of voices in these kids' ears. The idea of tampering is it's non-existent. I, I laughed today. Uh, there was an announcement about, like, Michigan uh, for, for, for recruiting violations during COVID. Uh, a handful of their staffers are going to have recruiting restrictions or something. As if that freaking matters. Like, as if that matters at all. If ever there, I mean, there's never been a time where recruiting restrictions mattered less than they do right now. Because so much is happening outside uh, the realm of the assistant coaches. You know what I mean? So much is happening without the involvement of, like, assistant coaches. And maybe even coordinators. It might be the head coach, and sometimes it's not even there. So the idea of, like, tampering, like, oh, I heard this school was tampering. Well, it probably wasn't that school. You know, it probably wasn't, um, you know, take your pick, uh, you know, pick pick a coach. It probably wasn't Lane Kiffin trying to, you know, tamper with somebody. It was probably someone operating on behalf of Ole Miss's collective, which, you know, is that tampering? It's somebody who's not even affiliated with school. And they might even not even talk to the player. They might reach out to that agent or that representation, the advisor or whatever it is. Is that even like tampering anymore? So there, there are a lot of voices and, and all it takes is like the right voice saying the right thing. And the kid says, you know what? I could, I can get more this year. I don't need to stay here. I can, I can get more. And so you're seeing like some ridiculous stuff, uh, like really ridiculous stuff. There were a couple I noted today, Anthony Johnson, who I think is from Greensburg. He went to Youngstown state, um, you know, had a really good season last year, Youngstown State. In December, he went into the transfer portal and transferred to Illinois. Okay? Nice. You know, good for him. I mean, like, to some extent, that's sort of how this should work. I, I think the transfer portal and 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 the uh, advent of, like, mass transfers, I think there were two ways it would work sort of most ideally. That guy at the lower level who develops into a big-time player who can move up to the Power Five and, and and live his dream of playing there for his last year or two, like Jared Verse going from Albany to Florida State, like this, Anthony Johnson going from Youngstown State to Illinois. That's great. The other side would be guys who just, and just as we say this just as Christian Bayer popped up, guys who get passed over in the depth chart. They don't feel like they're going to get an opportunity to play. They want to transfer to another school or another level and find an opportunity to play. That That's sort of the, you know, uh, purest. P-U-R-E-S-T, purest form of all this stuff. Um, so Anthony Johnson does that, right? December, he goes into the transfer portal. He, he, he's a defensive end uh, from Youngstown State. Goes into the transfer portal in December, transfers to Illinois. All right. Goes through spring camp, and he's back in the portal. Probably got a check. Probably got a, a five checks or whatever. You know, probably got monthly payments from Illinois for the last four or five months. And he's back in the portal, and he's heading off somewhere else. I don't know where he's going to end up, the SEC or someplace. Another one that I just saw today, Derek Graham. And and I, I, I noticed this name, and I'm like, wait, that sounds familiar. 
Yeah, he was at, he was at Troy. He was a Troy offensive lineman. And Pitt tried to get him. I think Pitt actually had him on campus for a visit. I actually should look that up. I, I, I feel like I'm going to have texted with this kid. I, I should have looked this up earlier. Let me look. Derek Graham. There he is. Yeah. Uh Oh, in January. In January. He visited. Look, all, all these text messages. So Pitt recruited this guy in January. Uh, he ultimately, he took a visit to Pitt. He ultimately went to Texas A&M and he went into the portal today. Like he was literally at Texas A&M for less than four months. And he went into the transfer portal today. He probably got like three or four checks and he's back in the portal. And then, I mean, like sort of the, 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 if there comes a point where change is made and, and they want sort of a poster boy for why it's ridiculous, there's, there's. Caden Proctor, right? The guy who's a big offensive lineman, committed to Iowa as, as a high school kid, flipped to Alabama right before signing day, plays as a true freshman this past year at Alabama, goes in the portal when Nick Saban leaves, transfers to Iowa in January. Before March even ended, he announced he was going back in the portal. Today, it made it official, and, and he's going back to Alabama. I very much believe that these... Student athletes are young men. They're adults capable of making their own decisions, and we should treat them as adults. You know, like a lot's being asked of them. Uh, you know, they they should be treated as adults. But like, what the hell are these guys doing? He's bouncing all over because, like, the thing is, when they start moving like this, the like, there's always been that line of logic of like, well, coaches could just leave whenever they want. They do, but no coach has ever – well, I shouldn't say no coach. I'm sure somewhere along the line somebody has done something the equivalent of what Caden Proctor did. And somebody has done the equivalent of what you know Derek Graham or Anthony Johnson did and, and left the job four months after taking it. Todd Graham left 10 months, 11 months after taking the pit job, right? But the more that this happens, the more ridiculous it gets, and, and you start moving past the point of even what coaches are willing to do. I, like, I'll, I'll be honest – Right now, even as we sit here talking about Cam Corn and Damian Dunn, I, I feel like I have to add little caveats like, you know, well, I mean, assuming they're on the roster. Because who's to say? Who's to say, uh, pick a school? Who's got, like, stupid money? Tennessee or Texas. Who's to say, ten, ten, you know, Texas doesn't come in tomorrow and says, Man, we could really use a backup center. Cam Corn, we'll give you seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to come be our backup center. Like, who's to say that's not going to happen? And because there's no contracts, because there's nothing binding, because there's nothing holding anybody in place, or holding anyone to their word, or holding any anyone to to a previously agreed upon deal, it could totally happen, and it'd be gone. And so it, it's funny, like. I mean, I made the joke about, you know, tomorrow's roster isn't promised to anyone, but like I mean, even guys that are committing today, I don't think we can, I mean, you can't really count on it until you see them in a game. And I mean, if you really want to get paranoid about it, they could leave the next day, the day after the game. <laughs> it's, it's a silly season and somehow every portal window season has gotten more and more ridiculous i mean you roll the clock back to post spring 2022 when jordan addison left up to you know december of 2022 and the transfer portal stuff and and then you go to last spring and then just you know december 23 and december 23 got more ridiculous than any than than you know spring 23 was which was more ridiculous than december 22 was and now spring 24 Four is turning out to be even more ridiculous than December 23 was. And, and I don't just mean on the pit level. I mean, just across the country, you see the sheer number of guys going into the portal, the sheer number of guys on the move, prominent players, starters, guys with featured roles, and they're taking a step away. They're walking away to get a bigger deal. Because if we want to break down all the different possible reasons that guys would transfer, I mean, there's you could be closer to home, make yourself a better NFL prospect, increase your draft stock, uh, showcase yourself, all those things. More and more of these decisions you're looking at, there's they're, 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 all of those 
potential reasons are being stripped away. And it just leaves one. There's only one thing that it's about. And that's the money. All right, comments and questions. Let's let's get back into it. Tim McConkey is a uh, super chatter. Tim says, what do you think Capo will do with the four spot? Guillermo Diaz Graham, a transfer? Uh, I mean, I've been saying it. I actually said it. Tim, you should watch the morning pit from this morning. Uh, or you should read the message boards at pantherlair.com. You see the website below, right? Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. I- I've been saying it. Like, I think they're penciling in Guillermo as the starter at the four. And I don't think it's the worst idea. I've, I've come around on it a little bit. We only saw a tiny bit of it during the games last season. But I've come around on the idea. I mean, he's he's a good enough shooter to to score from out there. Um, I think he's a decent enough passer. He's, he doesn't have a great handle, but, I mean, neither did Blake Hinson. You know, how often was Blake Hinson trying to take guys off the dribble? He would just sort of crash into people and hope he got a foul. Um, he's not a great player post scorer but again neither was Hinton despite his size he wasn't really all that effective um, in the lane but he's a good shooter from outside you know I think he can he can do things there and defensively again it's not like Hinton was a great defender so I I could see Diaz Graham uh, Guillermo fitting there and and, and as you know I specify as Guillermo but really Jorge would probably be his backup at the power forward spot I really thought that, that getting a transfer would be the priority. Um, and, and I think they've tried. I think they've worked on guys, but they've, they've missed on a few. And I think they're comfortable with Guillermo if that's kind of what it ends up being. So, you know, and again, I, I went, I went, I think I went further in depth on that on the morning pit this morning. So, uh, Tim, you should check that out. Uh, also look on the message boards at pantalore.com. We have long discussions there. I mean, look, pantalore.com. It, it's the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet for a reason. And it's, we provide a lot of content, but also we have great conversation and discussions on the message board. And a lot of the things we're talking about here, we've been hashing out on the message board for the last eight hours, eight days, eight weeks. However <laughs> long it's been, we've been covering all these things a lot. And so you want to be part of those conversations at panther lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. We got a lot of, uh, a lot of comments and questions here. I want to um, I want to talk about this linebacker situation real quick. Because, I mean, that was ostensibly why we did this uh, live show. Although part of it is just people have a lot of stuff to talk about, right? I mean, we, we know there's a lot to discuss um, right now with the transfers and, you know, transfers out and transfers in. But I wanted to make this one specifically about Solomon Shields and going and what it does to the linebacker depth. Uh, but maybe, you know, maybe we can just take more comments and questions. Maybe we'll make the morning Monday, uh, the the morning pit could be about the linebacker depth. But uh, let's scroll through here. Homer Simpson says, I work with members of the Hayes family. I asked them today why you transferred. They responded, we ain't got no quarterback. You know, I don't know if that I, – I probably shouldn't have even read that. I don't know if that's valid or not. I have no idea if you're telling the truth. If by any chance there's even a sliver of truth to what to, to what you're saying, or if we take even Dayon Hayes, you know, with that DM exchange that, that got out between him and Chris Carter, that Chris Carter, you know, from the Post-Gazette put in his article where Hayes said, you know, I, I, you know, I just don't think we're going to win. The implication being the offense wasn't good enough. I mean, he was here last year, right? I, I can't imagine that he saw anything last spring that led him to believe their offense was going to be great. You know, with Frank Signetti running the offense and Phil Dracovic as the quarterback, I can't imagine that Hayes was all that encouraged by what he saw out of uh, um, Phil Dracovic last spring. So, and I, I also can't imagine whatever he saw this spring was any worse than what he saw a year ago. So I don't know if I really buy that concept. Um, Let's see. Uh, TRR says, why do I feel like the linebacking core will be okay if no one else leaves? I, You know, so here's where it gets tricky. Because I, I think you can kind of say both. That on one hand, it's bad to lose a player with DeShield's experience and DeShield's ability and his talent. Uh, and obviously what he brings to the table. On the other hand, I, I think you can also say at the same time, it's still a pretty 
there, there are a lot of promising players in this group. I mean, we talked about the linebackers being one of the deepest, most promising, maybe most exciting position groups on the, the team and, and the defense. Um, and I think that's largely still true. You know, set aside those those veteran guys. Set aside the Shields and Brandon George. You know, they brought in Key Thompson as a transfer from Ohio. He didn't practice all spring because he was hurt, but a guy who has a lot of experience, he was really productive, you know, could feature or function as a backup middle linebacker or step into that role or the money linebacker. Um, either way, uh, he could play there, and maybe he ends up being DeShields' replacement at money. I don't know. That remains to be seen. But you've got Kyle Lewis, who I think the staff is really excited about as your penciled in starting star linebacker you've got and then you've got those guys who were true freshmen last year Jordan Bass and Rasheem Biles Biles was one of the best players in the spring game on Saturday uh and Braylon Lovelace who was really a standout as a true freshman last year and got a lot of work as the backup middle linebacker this spring with Key Thompson being out Lovelace ended up getting a lot of work there in addition to his work at money linebacker and so even if you take the shields out of the mix, I think you can build a pretty good two deep with Lewis, George, Thompson, Biles, Lovelace, and Bass. Whether you're starting Lewis, George, and Lovelace, or Lewis, George, and Thompson, uh, you know, and, and you're rotating in Biles and Bass and and whoever either Lovelace or Thompson I think it's a really good group I think it's really athletic at the outside linebacker positions um Brandon George in his final year of eligibility I I, I think is a, is a solid player I think he can do a decent job there uh and and they've got other options too that they should even be able to rotate at the middle linebacker position which they didn't really they weren't really able to do that for the past few years and to some extent I mean they had Servassier Dennis they don't want to rotate him um but they haven't really rotated the middle linebackers at all. You know, a little bit here or there. But they should have the depth and the talent with George, Thompson, and even Lovelace that they can rotate those guys more this year. And so it's a good group. So I, I tend to agree with you, TRR. If they don't lose anybody else, and maybe, I mean, they could probably withstand like one more defection depending on who it is you know because you could get through a year if you have five healthy linebackers with the 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 diversity of talents and skill sets that they've got and how they fit into these the the positions in this defense I, i think you can make it through the season with five guys so they could probably absorb one but i mean i think that's a testament to how they've recruited the position and and how it's been built plus and i mean i talk about oh if you lose one more guy they're bringing in Cam Lindsay, a four-star linebacker from Aliquippa. Uh, Davin Bruton, who I think is a really good middle linebacker prospect from New Jersey. And then they have Jeremiah Marcelin, who is another, you know, a guy who can play inside or money, um, who enrolled in January, you know, and had a nice spring. So it's funny to say it that like, oh, DeShields was maybe, you know, one of the two or three best players on defense, maybe one of the two or three best players on the team. They lose him, and yet I think they'll be okay at linebacker. It's funny to say it, but it's it's kind of true. So, you know, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I think they'll be okay. Excuse me, defensive end, they took a big hit. I, I, I put up uh, an article on pantheller.com this afternoon, just kind of breaking down what the depth chart looks like a defensive end and linebacker without Hayes and DeShields. And linebacker, you can build a pretty solid two deep. Defensive end, like we talked about, um, I guess yesterday, uh, on on yesterday's live show, I mean, defensive end gets pretty dicey. Uh, when you, I mean, it was dicey with Hayes in the mix. It gets really dicey when you take Hayes out of the mix because you're you're talking about starting Nate Matlack, which I think was going to happen with Hayes here. But then you're looking for that other starting spot, and you know, Bam Brima played a lot of defensive tackle this spring. You move him back to defensive end. I guess he could be a starter. Jimmy Scott was, uh, I think the first defensive end taken, the first underclassman defensive end drafted in the blue gold game draft last, uh, last week. And so maybe he would be a starter sincere Edwards, who I think had a pretty good chance to be on the two deep anyway, as a true freshman is almost certainly going to be there now. 
And then you, you're still like searching. You're like, well, who else? Antonio came in and Maverick Grazio. David Ojebwe, the transfer from Clemson, who doesn't seem like he did a whole lot this spring. Didn't really stand out all that much. The options are really, I mean, they're going to have to find another defensive end. It seems like they have to go get one from the portal. I just don't know what they're going to be able to get, what they're going to be able to afford, and what kind of player they're going to be able to bring in. And so that's a much bigger concern than the linebacker situation. DeShields, it stings because of how you know good I think he is um, and how he was going to fit into this defense and everything. It stings extra because it comes a day after Hayes leaving, but they should be okay at linebacker. Defensive end is going to be – it's a problem. It's a concern. Um, let's see. Get into as many of these comments and questions as we can here. Uh, yeah, uh, Homer Simpson says, I'd like to see Julian Duggar get a lot more work with Christian Bayer leaving. Could be a blessing in disguise. You know, I, we haven't mentioned that as well. Christian Bayer announced today that he's going into the transfer portal. No big surprises there. I, I think from the time that we could tell that it became pretty clear that Eli Holstein passed him on the depth chart. I think we knew that Bayer was a pretty likely candidate to go into the transfer portal, and he ultimately did. Uh, he's going in as a grad transfer, but there is, you know, there, you know, they, they did pass a rule or there's a, an injunction or something that you can make multiple transfers. Now that it used to be you transfer once you get that for free, you get to play right away now, you know, now, but if you went a second time, if you transferred more than once, you would have to sit out a year after that second transfer or whatever it is. Now that's not even the case. So Vare would get to play right away anyway because he's a grad transfer. But with this, you know, rule change, another rule change, he could play right away even if he wasn't a grad transfer. Uh, but once he got passed by Eli, Eli Holstein, I mean, there was no way that a guy who started five games last season was going to stick around and be the number three quarterback, and that seemed sort of inevitable. Uh, and and I mean, to some extent, I think even going into spring camp, we looked at the situation and said, you know. It's probably unlikely they'll have five scholarship quarterbacks or these five scholarship quarterbacks heading into the season. And sure enough, fair leaves. I don't know about the other four. I mean, obviously, I think Yarnell, Eli Holstein, probably Julian Duggar are sound. You know, I, I, Yarnell is the, the presumptive starter. Holstein is the number two. Duggar is a true freshman. I don't see him really, really going anywhere. I think he wants to, to stick it out and see what he can do. I, you know, I don't know about Ty Diefenbach. It depends on on if he's content to be the number three quarterback or or to battle Duggar for the number three quarterback if that's what it ends up being. Um, you know, it's it's up to him if if he wants to be in that role or if he feels like he's going to get an opportunity to move out of that role to climb at all. Uh, and if he doesn't, maybe he'll choose to go and they'll end up with three scholarship quarterbacks, which is pretty thin. You know, obviously they last year they went through three. Um, they used three in two thousand twenty two. They used three in 2021, right? They used three in 2020. <laughs> when was the last time they didn't use? And, and it wasn't they just they used three because they got mop-up duty. They used three because they needed them. You know, 2020, Kenny Pickett got hurt. McPaddy got hurt. Joey Yellen played. You know, 2021, Kenny Pickett played. And then in the Peach Bowl, they needed Patty because Pickett left the team. And Davis Bevel because Patty got hurt. 2022, Slovis got hurt. And uh, Patty came in, Patty got hurt, and Nate Yarnell had to play. Then, then last year, they go Dracovic to Vayer uh, to Yarnell because the first two guys stunk. It wasn't even about injury. 2019, uh, they they only used two quarterbacks that year, as far as I can remember. It was Kenny Pickett. He got hurt. Nick Patty came in and played a little bit. Remember, he threw a touchdown pass against UCF in that 2019 game and then played the whole next week against Delaware because Kenny was a little banged up. 2018... Kenny was pretty solid in 2018. I don't know if I don't know if he got hurt at all in 18, but 2017 they had used three quarterbacks. You know, um, Brown and Max Brown and Ben Denucci, um, partially because they both stunk and they kept flipping back and forth between them. Then Brown got hurt, so Denucci had to come in. Then Denucci's helmet strap came off, or helmet came off, so Kenny Pickett had to come in. So they ended up with three quarterbacks that year too. 2016 they only used one, really. It was just Nate Peterman. So. <laughs> I, my point is they often need three quarterbacks and I, you know, 
most coaches would prefer not to have a true freshman as your number three quarterback in that situation. <clears throat> Although that was the case in 2017, it worked out okay. So, but I digress. Uh, Christian Bayer going into the transfer portal uh, takes another one off. That's what three guys now uh, with Hayes, the Shields, and Bayer. So the list is 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 going. We'll have to update our transfer tracker. We have that on Pantheler.com on the message boards at Pantheler.com. We have a transfer tracker. Uh, that we started uh, in the uh, in the off season. We started in December. Well, the last one we had was Carter Johnson. We'll have to update that. See where uh, he ended up somewhere. FAMU or someplace like that. Uh, Florida A and M, um, something like that. But uh, we'll have to see see where that is and and start getting in these other additions and departures. Because uh, the spring transfer portal window is upon us. Um, BGH Blitz says, so a lack of confidence in the direction of the program is a bad reason to leave. I thought money was the wrong reason. So you're talking about uh, th that comment was posted early on when I was talking about why uh, these guys chose to go into the portal and day on Hayes seemingly saying, well, you know, he didn't think they had a good chance to win. It's not about like, I think it's different for guys who are in their last year of eligibility. You know, I mean, I think, I mean, this year is the final year for Hayes and DeShields to showcase themselves and, and build their draft stock and give themselves a chance to, to prove themselves as pro prospects. And I think you're taking a risk when you leave a known situation. And by known situation, I don't mean the, you know, what you know about the offense or the quarterback, but a known situation in terms of what the defense is, how you fit into it and how you're going to be featured and used. Um, it, it's a risk to leave a known situation for an unknown where who knows if you're going to be a starter, who knows if it's going to be a defense that fits you, who knows if it's going to be a defense that features you, who knows if it's going to be a defense that you pick up well enough over the next four months that you're able to play fast and aggressive and make plays. All those things are a factor. All those things have to be a factor or should be a factor. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if they were feel like it's just just the money um scrolling through here homer simpson says these guys leaving saying they're not good enough could bring this team together for a special season fingers crossed i mean sure <laughs> i guess I, I like if you want to look for some potential uh you know, silver lining. I uh, go ahead. You know, I, I I'll take that. Sure. Benjamin Glazer says, Chris, surely someone has explained to these young men what a 1099 is, in particular tax implications of multi-state NIL deals. I mean, what is the likelihood of a number of delinquent college athletes? I mean, it it's going to be interesting. I mean, it's tax time, right? Today's the 16th. A lot of these guys who got paid last year probably made more than six hundred dollars, and if you do that, you got to claim it, which means a ten ninety nine. You're an independent. I assume it's a ten ninety nine as an independent contractor, which means you owe like a quarter of that money. So if you got two hundred thousand dollars or one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, I'm doing the ones that are easily divisible by four. Uh, if you got two hundred thousand dollars in two thousand twenty three, or you got one hundred sixty thousand dollars in two thousand twenty three, guess what? You owe pretty big chunk of that right i, I mean like if you got two hundred thousand dollars you owe you know let's say round number a quarter of that you got 50 grand you got 50 grand that you're gonna be able to pay the government because you i mean and, 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 and who knows i i you know i think it's entirely possible that these uh you know either the collectives or the agents or people advising these people uh these players are are you know, putting them in good position that some of that money that comes in each month, they set it aside, they put it into an account, uh, they pay estimated taxes, something like that to not be facing that situation. But I mean, I hope, I hope that's the case uh, or else that could be a, a rude awakening. I think there are tax implications here for what these guys are, are getting and, and what that money looks like. Um, you hope they have good, good advisors and someone looking out for them. 